What's up? I'm Steve from Liquid Light Lab and welcome to Psychedelic Light Show Book Review. Today I'm going to be talking about Live at the Fillmore East, which features the photographs of Amelie Rothschild. And it has an excellent chapter on the Joshua Light Show. And I'm going to use her photographs and this book as a vehicle to explain the Joshua Light Show, how they worked, how light shows in the 1960s worked, and talk about the various analog methods that were used in these days so let's get to it here we have live at the fillmore east a photographic memoir by amelie rothschild amelie rothschild was the house photographer at the fillmore east as well as a member of joshua light show and later joe's lights the fillmore east is a legendary new york city venue that was started by bill graham Bill Graham is a famous concert promoter who started the Fillmores out in California, namely the Fillmore and the Fillmore West, and then wanted to bring the experience to New York City. Here we have a cool aerial shot of the Fillmore East. This is on 2nd Avenue in the East Village of New York. And he had an incredible array of musicians come through. Musicians such as the Grateful Dead, Joni Mitchell, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, uh, The Doors, Pink Floyd, you name it, they came through the venues. Basically a who's who of psychedelic 1960s era music. So one of the things that Bill Graham wanted to make sure he had in his venue was a light show. And in comes the Joshua Light Show. All right, Joshua Light Show was a house light show at the venue. They later became Joe's Lights, as in Average Joe, G.I. Joe. It was a play on the name Joe. Uh, the venue also had Mark Rubenstein's Pig Light Show play there, uh, as well as visiting artists such as Glenn McKay, who would come through when he was on tour with J the Jefferson Airplane. This book has an excellent chapter on the Joshua Light Show, talking about their history, uh, how they operated, the equipment they used, and various stories of their, their adventures there. So we're going to talk a little bit about this chapter and just basically go through um, the Joshua Light Show. We're going to talk about what light shows of the 1960s were. Um, and their place in it, and why they were probably the best light show of the 1960s. The light shows of the 1960s were live performances. These weren't pre-programmed mechanical visuals or anything like that. These were real people working in tandem as a group, as an orchestra of sorts of light, projecting onto the screen and working in unison with the music. They basically were another instrument, except one that you would see with your eyes at these venues and in the 1960s. And they use all sorts of equipment. Um, you can see here, we have overhead projectors, we have film projectors, we have slide projectors. You see some of the slides back here. We have different wheels and reflective things that the projectors would bounce light across. We would also have pure improvised light where light would itself would be bounced off various reflective surfaces and projected onto the screen and it would move in real time with the music all right so these were very sophisticated uh works of performance art that were happening live with the music and the joshua light show was famous for this they actually had billing right here at every show, Joshua Light Show. They would also receive billing on the concert posters um, and occasionally would get their name up on the billboard as well. So these were highly respected artists and work that they were doing. Let's get into a little bit of the nitty gritty of the light show. The Joshua Light Show was named for its director, Joshua White, and included Bill Schwarzbach, Tom Shoesmith as founding members, and then were quickly joined by Cecily Hoyt, Ken Rickman, Jane Rixman, and Gene Thiel, and then also included Amelie Rothschild, as well as Dennis Clark, Alan Arkush, and other folks who joined um, the light show, especially when it became Joe's Lights. So let's go through some of the different elements of the Joshua Light Show and 
the equipment they use and how they worked. All right. Basically, you would have the wet show, which would have been liquids uh, using overhead projectors and modified projectors. They actually had special projectors that were modified using airplane landing lights. They would also get the liquid so hot that they would boil. This was a unique thing of the Joshua Light Show. Now, in addition, they also used dry media, which would be the dry show, which would include slides, um, slide projectors, as well as film and film loops. And these were would be projected by themselves or in tandem with other projectors or placed the beam would go through color wheels and things of that sort and bounced off mirror wheels and then projected onto the screen. Here we have an excellent photo of Ken Rickman at an overhead projector with a cutout there and as well as some slide projectors and you can see how these are going through the color wheel discs that will then change the color of the light and add additional motion and effects to it. As you can also see here, they would have had a mirror wheel uh, and all sorts of cool reflective materials that the light would bounce off of and project onto the screen. Here we have Dennis Clark and Cecily Hoyt with Alan Arkush at the overhead projectors. You can see their liquids, their glass, you can also see the other appendages, such as the mirror wheel over here, that would sometimes be, uh, the projectors would be turned sometimes to face the mirror wheel, and then that would be projected onto the screen. The Joshua Light Show was notable for having a Lumia artist. This would have been Tom Shoesmith, who hung out on the top platform, and he would take pure light and refracted off various materials such as mylar, polished metal, uh, and other things that would break up the light and then shoot it out back at the screen. And the term Lumia, of course, was coined by Thomas Wilfred uh, in the early part of the 1900s. Here you can see various dry media. You can see film, the film projectors, you can see the slides over here in the back. Um, and you can see the overhead projector here as well. But this was, of course, a complex array of equipment that was used. And here's Ken Rickman at a mixing board. So all of the equipment that you see all ran together to the mixing board. And this is where Joshua would hang out and he would uh, blend and fade in the different elements um, while the show was happening. He was a director. Um, they also all communicated with headsets, which made the show very sophisticated. They were all able to talk amongst each other and discuss what they were doing. Um, and also later on end up getting closed circuit television so they can see what was happening. So the communication, the centralized mixing console, all really helped uh, push the light show to, to where it was. Here you can see all the, the various liquids that they had, as well as these platforms where different materials would be set up on. Here we have Becky Smith prepping some of the light show wet plates in the back there. You can see all their oils and various liquids here. And here are the slides as well that would be shown. If you've seen some of my other things that I post on my social media, I actually have a whole bunch of these slides. Um, and I'm currently working on something to get them out to people. More on that later. Here we have some excellent photos of the wet show with organist Virgil Fox who came to the Fillmore East. Look at that color. And we also here have some Lumia work as well. It's beautiful, beautiful stuff. So one of the things that really, really uh, helped the Joshua Light Show uh, evolve to where it was, was they were able to have a permanent installation at the venue. 
unlike a West Coast show or shows at a lot of other venues when they they would have to load in on Thursday, set up all their stuff, troubleshoot, etc., perform and then break down on Sunday and take everything home. Not them. They had the luxury of having this stuff permanently set up so every week they can come in and try new things, constantly experiment, uh, leave things in place that saved them a lot of time and basically was a fertile, fertile place for experimentation and innovation, uh, which is why they are arguably the best light show of this era. Now, this photo might look like they're on the ground, but actually this is all up in the air. So you can see actually all of that stuff, it's actually one level up. This area down here on the ground was where the musicians would stage their equipment before they went on. The light show was actually a rear projection show and it was only about 20 feet from the screen. Here you can see the screen here. All right, let's get to a photo here. This is actually a curved screen and they were actually behind the screen rear projecting. Here's another shot of it. So here's a stage. You can see the wedges down here. This is the actual stage. Here is that area underneath where the musicians would stage their amps and gear and all that. And then up here on the second level, bolted to the brick wall at the back of the venue, you had the platforms where the Joshua Light Show would hang out. And then even above that is where you had Tom Shoesmith with his Lumia. So this was quite a sophisticated show. And again, having that permanent installation really, really helped uh, them develop their, their skills and their artwork there. Now, the rear projection show also was uh, quite unique. It's very difficult to get a rear projection set up. Usually you have to project, you have to front project, right? You'll be at the front of the venue projecting at the stage. However, they were able to get this so they were just 20 feet away and were able to modify their equipment to be able to hit the whole screen or create arrays of equipment that would then cover the screen as a collage of sorts. So here we have the Allman Brothers Band and you can see this is actually rear projected. The light show was behind the screen. So the screen would come down, cover up everything that's in the back of the venue and Voila, this would show up. Now, the, the benefits of this, besides a aesthetic and artistic uh, situation where it made the light show look mysterious, you would just see this glowing ethereal artwork moving. And if you didn't know, you really didn't know where it came from. So that mystery really added an element of magic to it. And there's also a technical uh, benefit to rear projecting where you can have stage lights as well as flash photography can be used to uh, photograph or put light on the screen and it won't conflict with it because they're projecting from the rear causing the screen to glow on our side. You then don't have to worry about the washing out. Here are some great slides of the light show in action. You have the famous Welcome to the Fillmore East slide being projected. We bid you good night, good night, good night. This would be shown after the show was over. And you can just see all this beautiful artwork that was created using the array of equipment that all the artists working in tandem as an orchestra would uh, project. And again, this stuff was all in motion. This isn't static images. This was a living thing being projected onto the screen behind the musicians. We got some great photos of the light show and the musicians. Chuck Berry with the Joshua Light Show. Taj Mahal. Look at that, that's beautiful. So here you can see the stage with the screen pulled up. And so up here is where you would have the light show be set up. 
Here's Jimi Hendrix practicing on stage. Here's actually the screen, which would then come down. Jimi Hendrix Live at the Fillmore East is probably one of the best Jimi Hendrix recordings, in my opinion. This would have been with the band The Gypsies. Uh, if you know the song Machine Gun, it had the definitely the best version of it. It was played there at the venue. Here we have a legendary show. This is The Grateful Dead with the Allman Brothers and Mick Fleetwood all jamming together. And, of course, you can see the light show behind them. Here we have The Who. The um, the Who played Tommy for the first time in the United States at the Fillmore East. And the Joshua Light Show uh, built a show uh, to assist with the theatrical performance of this. You know, as we know, Tommy is a rock opera. So they also devised visuals that would go along with the different scenes of the of this musical piece, of the story. Here's a great show of Albert King with Joe's Lights. The Fillmore family also did work outside of the venue, uh, namely Woodstock. So the audio folks came and did the Woodstock show. And this was actually the Joshua Light Show screen. And they were supposed to perform. The Joshua Light Show was supposed to perform at Woodstock. But as we know, the weather was terrible. Um, and the screen fell down. It was ultimately just used to cover up the instruments. So it was a flop, but honestly, the, the Woodstock was pretty much seen as the beginning of the end of this music scene. Suddenly, people saw how big this could actually be. The money, they smelled the money, and different people started coming in. Uh, the performers started commanding higher fees, and a small venue like the Fillmore East was no longer able to sustain itself. Um, and shortly after this, Bill Graham decides to pull the plug on the venue. And this book has a great chapter about why he decided to do that and what his reasoning for that was. If you want to buy this book, you can get this book used for about $54, $55. New, it goes for about $75, but it is out of print. Uh, I believe this came out in 1999.